Where are they? Yeah, that should be that should be the first thing that was on the screen when you came in here. Oh, this happened in the other room, right? Okay. Well done. Design International, always ambitious being permies. There's actually six of them that are going to present in rapid fire order for a couple minutes each. Uh, and then we're going to hear from Simon from Lush Cosmetics and close with, as many of you probably know, Maddie from Permaculture UK. Um, so we should have this sorted in just a moment. I suggest we think about starting the session five minutes late. Uh, give us, take the pressure off us. So if oh, everyone just, if yeah, everyone so just talks. Oh, okay. In round two, we're going to start out with a little spoken word piece. While we're working out that Tremendous. Oh. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Can I leave you? Hello out there okay. in IPC land. I need your attention. We're listening to reports from the new civilization. This new civilization, you must understand, is one in which we respect living creatures and the land. Today, we have an interview with a guest whom we can trust. It's Mr. Big Mountain, all the way from Earth's crust. Mr. Mountain, please, we request your information. Relay to us the fate of the human civilization. You say, young man, you know me been here for long a time. I say long before the beginnings of humankind. Me seen the rise and fall of nations. Me sit with a mountain's patience. And now a message from the Earth. I will provide translation. Say human civilization is involved in the creation of a planet that's a piece of with all of our relations. We've got a ways to go. But of this you got to know, that if you were to heal the earth, you'll reap just what you sow. Say heaven on the earth, as above and so below. This garden can be yours if you choose to let it flow. Whoa, 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 wait. Choose to let it flow? What does that mean? We humans need advice that can be heard, felt, touched, or seen. Mr. Big Mountain, queen of what a how or who? Tell us, Mr. Mountain, what can we do? A say, a you a can a begin a in a your very own backyard. A say, plant yourself a garden even if the ground is hard. Create a household compost and your plants will grow most. And a cook the food you grow to share because you are a good host. Respect the four elements, earth, air, water, and fire. Reducing your consumption is some things which we aspire. Say, be good to yourself and work for planetary health. And know that in the world you don't need money to know you have wealth. Well, thank you, Mr. Mountain, for your, your information. That's all, folks, for reports from the new civilization. Please stay tuned for our upcoming broadcast and think about a new world where the Earth is first at last.
we can only have one computer plugged in, and if we're going to fix this one, we need to be working on this. Yeah, you can do that. Cool. It's nice. That's, that's absolutely great, yeah. But as I say, if you start late, just finish late. All right, so we're, getting, we're taking a little more time to work out the technical issues. This is a great chance to work on the question that Andy gave us in the opening presentation. Does everybody remember what that question was? No. Does anybody remember what that question was? <laughs> Stefan, he's a man in charge. I don't remember. No? No, no, you do <laughs> What was it? What kind of world? What is our biggest dream? What is your greatest hope for the future? What is your greatest hope for the future? So find someone you don't know, ideally on either side of you, and chat for a few minutes. And we'll have PowerPoints ready before you know it. You know what the problem might be? Yeah, the computer was turned off.
the need for scaled up professional level responses to complex global challenges, a group of very accomplished permaculture designers, each having you know, 15 to 20 plus years of experience running businesses and doing permaculture design, they formed a collaborative called the Permaculture Design International. And so you can get a brief taste from five, maybe six of them. Jeremiah's got a book. Uh, and please welcome our poet who you already met named Andrew Millicent. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah, so um, we have been in discussions and formulations for the last year, and we are here to present to you today to hopefully uh, to show you the value of collaborative enterprise, right? And so we are still in the formulation and, and experimental phase of this, but we've put a lot of work in. We wanted to share with you uh, some of what we've done and hopefully impart to you some value that you can take into your own lives. So like I said, there's eight of us, we're all located in the US, but uh, a number of us all work in various locations around the world. Um, and even within the US, we're all dispersed in geographic locations. Each one of us has our own networks of people that we work with in our local communities and networks of other professionals that we access in our own design work. And every one of us are, are PDC teachers as well. So we also have networks of, of students. Um, so, <clears throat> the, uh, there is an image that's not showing up, but you can all, oh, there we go. It's the mycelial net of professional connections. So each one of you in your own place, think about all of your professional connections, right? All the different students you have, all the different people that you resource to do your permaculture work wherever you are, and then think about adding your professional connections up with eight people. And think about the degrees of separation suddenly exist and the amount of resourcing that you can do when you need to find someone to fill some sort of niche or gap in a professional design arc. How many people here are would could consider yourself like a professional designer, like people pay you to do design work? Okay. Yeah, it's a number of people. So this whole thing started, this is a, uh, a mind map of the idea that formulated that we have. So there's a few things that went on that kind of sparked, sparked this light bulb off in my head here. One of the things was uh, one of my students went out and was a great uh, internet tech guy and threw up a website um, advertising their own services, right? And they got really high up in the search engine and they started receiving uh, requests for proposals. This is from a, a Chinese luxury developer was, went on Google and was looking around for people that can help them design an American style sustainable organic farm for their luxury development in China. So, they, so my students had this contact. They came to me like, hey, do you want to kind of get in on this? And I was like, wow, and this is really interesting. They didn't end up getting the job. I don't know what happened to it, but they went, wow, there are luxury developers from China Googling permaculture, regenerative farm, sustainable, and coming up with these different sites of designers. Uh, another thing was um, I had a, uh, an investor show up in my local area in Western Oregon who ended up coming to me and I helped him find some properties. Uh, he bought 500 acres of uh, farmland uh, in order to basically create uh, permaculture farms. Okay? And so he thought this was a good use of his investment capital. And then if you look at Google, suddenly uh, you type in permaculture and you have over 7 million hits. So people are, the, the meme is raising to this level where there's people that are really seriously looking in and looking for professional design services. So we were like, how can we create a really um, clean looking uh, website and presence that focus on design? And so when these people are out there searching for a design firm, they come across something that looks somewhat familiar to them. And it's like, oh, this is a design business that we could approach. Like these people are serious about design. So this is our uh, homepage of our website. And we basically took all of our portfolio and we consolidated them and we created this collaborative portfolio. So between all of our work, we have a really extensive, fairly deep uh, portfolio of work at different scales all over the world. And so um, kind of proof of work for those people that are searching out there looking for a design firm. And these are the types of clients uh, that we're looking to attract. We're looking at public sector, municipalities, governments, 
in the private sector, individuals and businesses, as well as NGOs and nonprofits. And that's how we have formulated our marketing attempts. And uh, like I said, we are still in process with this. And I'm going to pass it on now. So what we saw when we looked at the state of permaculture right now was the most, especially in the business area, was mostly as individuals, you know, mostly as disconnected individuals. And what collaboration we did see was mostly in the educational area, which we do, but right now we're talking about businesses. And that within this, there's like a few rock stars, but then there's mostly these, you know, independent contractors or businesses. And in this, it's very limiting in that each one of us has to create our own sort of the back-end services, you know, with booking, with um, administration stuff, with legal stuff and all that. And so um, what we believe right now, what, I, what we believe now is that now is the time for permaculture to step up. You know, I believe that within the community, within the world, permaculture needs to step up a level to address these broad scale needs and take on these large scale projects. And we believe collaboration is the way to do that. You know, by, as we said, by doing the collaboration within the business model and a new business, not necessarily a new business model, but a new business model to permaculture itself, where we create collaboration. So we can create huge skill sets. And the benefit of this is that in doing this collaboration, it actually is liberating for each of us involved in this. I don't have to do all my administration work. I, in fact, don't have to do a lot of the actual sitting down and drawing out. That's, I don't like, I like design. I like getting into certain things that are my passion. But when I have part of a client, I find myself at least half the time doing stuff that I'm not really into, but in order to do my work, I have to do it, right? So the thing <laughs> that we're seeing, you know, and also looking to other disciplines who have done this and who do this. But when you look to permaculture, you don't see this model so much in permaculture at all. And we really feel that if we're going to be effective as a community, if we're going to be effective in a lot of these things we're addressing with this conversion, we need to create collaborative systems. We need to do it. So um, with that, oh, and the idea of it is, is that streamlining. By having these collaborations, we create a lot of the back-end services so that we're freed up as individuals to do, to do these things, to do what is our passion as individuals within the context of a collaboration. scale water capturing underground using a general contractor uh, work that we can do and then this is a complex project in Miami which um, has a lot of different elements economic dealing with homeless family homeless uh, farming etc and this is a example of a beautiful built environment work <laughs> uh, sorry this is a built environment work that we're capable of and then this is um, ecological work in India. So uh, together we can do a, a 
many of the aspects I where I similarly we're we're all <coughs> very experienced but um, that we have different areas of expertise. Doesn't we have about uh, over a hundred years of experience of design and interpretation mm-hmm. and that uh, maybe it's time for Mr. Jim Moran to come talk about how we can do this. So permaculture is all about relationship, right? And collaboration. And so we are trying to do that in a business model, a physical manifestation in a business model of that. And so we encourage collaboration, people coming to us, us as we finish up a project, sharing that with others. Um, and so <coughs> basically we've taken, let's see, let's take one. So collectively we've taken over a year so far to work through all our administration um, processes. And this is an example of our client intake process. And so taking a, a, you know, eight different businesses client intake forms and working through that and taking the best pieces of each one of them and getting input and feedback and working through this collectively. This is just one example. We're talking about all of our internal documents and processes. So um, we feel like this is a stronger model to actually um, come at it from many different viewpoints than just the <coughs> one, okay? So again, we've, we've mentioned that before that you know, it's permaculture is about everything, right? And how can we be an expert in everything, right? We all have our own interests and likes and expertise and experience, right? So why don't we focus on what we love to do and what we're strong at and then find other people that can help fill in, be honest with ourselves about our limitations and find the people that can really fill that niche, right? So what's different, what's different from us What's different about this group from any other design group? So I've been in a lot of other design design groups that were part, you know, I'm one of pieces of the pie, so I'm one of the pieces of the pie. There's an engineer, a hydrologist, an architect, right? So in that piece, we're just throwing in little pieces of sustainable items in the whole picture that's not really looking at it in a permaculture lens. And that's what we're trying to offer, is we are the pie. So we're taking the project from the permaculture, looking at the whole project through a permaculture lens, okay? So here's just some of the different projects that we've worked in. This is in Africa. And then my background is mostly in green building and water, and so those are my strengths. So then when something comes up like solar, I'll find a subcontractor that's a local contractor that can really take that piece on and do it for me. And then so we can go from development work to actually high-end residential, green building, water reuse projects. Yeah, so um, so the, the interesting thing about the, the approach that we're taking is that we want to also create a more complex level or layer which includes the people and, and have projects um, that are not just a site or a project and we walk away, but it really is about the long-term viability of that project, right? And so it involves um, paying attention to enterprises and social systems and how that people are gonna live into it over a certain period of time, right? And so a site or a project, um, we want it to, to be vibrant over time. We want it to, to keep living and keep going to thrive and, and to be there for the long run, right? So that implies all sorts of other design pieces that you don't normally, might not normally consider for a physical site. Um, so we like to think of the perennial polycultures that may develop um, in the social system. So we, we'd like to co-design with the communities that are in and around the projects, um, focus on some of the core activities that, that can go on in a permaculture site, uh, like, like a nursery, for example. Um, the, which can be the driving engine for every other economic activity that's going on in the process and create lots of development um, in the right kind of way. So building permaculture understanding and skills capacity is another critical piece that can happen, um, that should, and then creating a regenerative economy and, and so developing that as well. So those are some pieces that add lots of value and, and not, ins- not necessarily ensure, but at least create the conditions that might ensure you know, long-term success. And then of course, create livelihood in the process. Uh, 
people. So one of the things we're doing, we're creating um, a sister nonprofit that called the Permaculture Fund, and and what we're going to do is uh, find creative ways, uh, creative ways to um, to fund projects that are very worthy to, but maybe are not paying. Pro you know, they can't afford to pay, and so leveraging basically paying clients and the funds that come in through there to then be able to leverage more funds um, from the you know, development community and foundations and such. So once again, re uh, creating regenerative ecologies, empowering communities, um, leveraging things like grants and donations, and then doing all types of innovative fundraising. And th th those are some of the ideas to be able to um, fund the work that we do and al also um, make this available to other projects that are worthwhile that other people might be doing. So. Why should we recreate the wheel? So as Rico mentioned, this is what we're all doing <laughs> every day. We're all doing administrative back-end work, and we're not able to focus on designing solutions. So why should we all be doing that? This is about cooperation, right, not competition. It's not really that complicated. It's a pretty simple idea here. Let's collaborate so that we can pool all our resources and our m energy into creating solutions. So, what are we going to offer? We, our, our plan is to offer affiliates and field partners these back-end services, administrative functions, so that anyone who has a complicated project that might be outside of their skill set can collaborate with us so that we can present a professional level design service to a client or municipal governments, large scale projects, regional, bioregional, on a watershed scale, which is where we need to be focusing on. We need to be getting the contracts and the bids that large scale engineering firms are getting, because they're gonna get those anyways. So we might as well be stepping up to the plate because we're the ones who need to be doing that, the work on the larger scale. So, pretty simple. We're gonna figure out client intake forms, systems, contracts and forms, <laughs> Streamline site assessment and project oversight so field partners and associates can approach us with the project and we can help with, I mean, we've got eight brains here that can all think differently. And so an incredible amount of complementary skill sets. And we're inviting more collaboration in because we need this collaboration at this point in time. It's absolutely critical. And then also, we can pool our resources together and, and create access to resources and technology like, for example, expensive computer programs or LIDAR mapping drones that no individually would be hard for us to purchase. However, together, we can put them together. Oh, that's my time is up. <laughs> so, <laughs> with that, I pass it on to Andrew again. Thank you. Yeah, so just in summary, well, um, <clears throat> so, yeah, so in summary, we haven't even officially launched this yet. We've just really been working in our pod to formulate the structures that are going to be, that would contain our, our vision. And we've already had, just through our own connections, we have two other members to our group, um, Neil Bertrando and Jenny Pell. And Jenny Pell is somewhat of a rainmaker in a sense where she just has lots of connections with larger clients. And we already have a, uh, some uh, people in Belize that want to develop a thousand acre eco resort that have already flown Mario and Jenny down there for an extended um, client interview and site visit. We already have a, a former student of mine who is connected with the Iraqi government. They're talking about doing a training and design in Baghdad. We already have all these different threads developing and what we're finding thus far in our experiment is, is that larger clients are looking for more organized, more professional looking design firms to, to do permaculture. Like this is actually a need that is out there. And you know, we are we are finding the proof of that before we even are marketing in a public way. Right? So, you know, our take home message is really the strength of collaboration that we can do more, we can accomplish more, we can get permaculture in my seat. 
helial threads of permaculture farther out into the places where it's needed by pooling our skill sets and our resources. And so I want to thank you all. Dot com. Dot com. So that's our website right there, permacultureintl.com. And so uh, I want to thank you all. For, we're going to have about 10 seconds. So thank you all for being here. Can we get a launch applause? sessions since we started a bit late the intent was to do 20 minute presentation 10 minute Q&A we're going to do five minute Q&A's for each of the presentations so we could close on time to honor that and then if people want to stick around after because it's lunch then you could step you could stay along and ask more questions um, with that are there any inquiring minds any questions So I would encourage some of those other people in the industry, if they want to be competitive in that way, perhaps they should bring permaculture to the board in their <laughs> businesses as well. Bring it. All right, now I'll turn this one off. <laughs> get along really well, which is amazing. <laughs> so fortunately, there's been very little drama thus far. However, in the interest of transparency, it's really important to have contracts and everything spelled out on paper. And it needs to be consensus. We're all equal owners of this company. And while consensus might appear like it's this magical thing in the sky that's impossible to attain, I think with compromise, it is possible. So that's pretty much been our, our process so far. But there's been a lot of hashing out, and a lot of it isn't figured out yet. So to be completely honest, part of our purpose here is to get feedback from the larger permaculture community to help us work through this together, because this model could be replicated infinitely. And that is, in my opinion, we want more competition. We want to see this whole thing. And there's no reason why this shouldn't pop up all over the world, and it should. Because if it's successful and we can crack the code and get into these, get the jobs that you're getting, we're getting, there's plenty of work out there. I, I believe that. I'd like to add something really quickly to you. That is, that, you know, many groups can do this, and let's figure out as a PMC how we can collaborate as well. There's no reason that we can't have multiple groups like this, or that we can't create a model where this collaboration uh, spreads out to in many, many different ways. It's it's all about design. It's thinking from the
the rest, so we are working on that. I was just wondering if all these guys and all the people working with you have done a PDC or something which uh, everybody shares the ethics of permaculture, since it's a question in our group, and that's a question. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, I mean, we're all teachers. I mean, we're fairly yeah. accomplished in terms of our core beliefs, which I can evoke pretty second generation yeah. long experience. And just with this question of ethics, in terms of one of, I see, the biggest challenges of moving up into the broad scale, you know, you know, very high level stuff is maintaining the ethical basis. Because I'm in very, and all of us share the idea that once you step outside the ethics, it's no longer harmful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You know, that's what I love about what we do. And so the huge question for us is not that we're just going to accept any client that comes to us. We're talking about client intake and selecting our clients as opposed to accepting them and saying, oh, sure, we'll do it. And um, we're very adamant about creating a way in which we continue to do that throughout the process. And if we are halfway through it and we see that actually this project is more of a greenwash or there's other this other stuff, you know, maintaining the, the ethical base where we can step away from the project because we actually see that underneath there are, you know, very deep issues. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges we're going to face mm -hmm. yeah. as this, you know, the type of scale we're going to. So it's a, it's a huge question. Alrighty, so we are going to transition now, similar to what Holmgren said, working through our second phase of technical difficulties. <laughs> and Simon's going to go ahead and step up naked without his PowerPoint. Uh, and so I'd like to introduce no, Simon Constantine, who's the head of ethical buying and head perfumer at Lush. He buys and sources the ingredients that Lush uses in their products. He helps set up co-ops with local people. He, uh, and he helped establish the Slush Fund, which you all heard about, that's helping Pern launch. Can we get a little hand for that? <laughs> and so this is in Simon's blood and his DNA, because his parents are the co-founders of Lush, two of the co-founders, and so he kind of has a sense of sustainability in his world. And he runs a fragrance department and loves creating new fragrances and believes in the potential for a revolution in the perfume industry. Uh, and this may be along the lines of too much information, but I have to say, you know, I've always had a hard time finding a deodorant that works. And then my wife gave me this little lush deodorant <laughs> stick. And I didn't pick up on it for a while, but I'd be in the sauna, I'd be all over the place, and people would be like, what's that smell? What's that smell? <laughs> that smells really good. I've gotten more compliments on my deodorant than pretty much probably anything else in my life. <laughs> I'm really thankful for this guy and his nose and his sense of sustainability. So please give a hand for Simon Constantine. Uh, hi, Christy. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll start off with my laptop and we'll transition nicely. Um, firstly, thanks very much for inviting me here. Uh, I did wonder whether some people thought what on earth a lush is doing at Permaculture Conference. Um, well, we've been working quite hard over the last few years on a quite a big kind of experiment, or a big experiment for us anyway. Is it that top one? No. no it's okay, it's on the stick, is it? It's on the stick, yeah. I don't know if I can. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, I think you shouldn't pay attention to I know, it's, yeah. so, it's so difficult. Um, so, the, the, the experiment really has been around permaculture and marrying that to business and looking to see how you can really kind of form sustainable, financially resilient enterprises with, with permaculture at their heart. And not only that, but looking at kind of the supply, so for, uh, from my, my perspective, the supply of raw materials, as a perfumer creating ingredients, I really love good quality materials and I care a lot about where they come from. And so it's really understanding that fair trade, sustainable, organic, all those things have been really great and have taken us to this point. Um, at Lush, we've, we've supported a lot of those, those movements in the way that we can, either by buying ingredients or uh, for fair trade, we were a part of their initial cosmetic uh, standard. Yeah, I'm sure you'll get on with that, you'll be fine. Okay. Ta-da! Does the flicker work? Yeah. Okay. 
do a presentation. Do a presentation. Um, yeah, so really uh, trying to understand that and kind of look at where materials are coming from, understanding the business is driving a lot of problems that we see out there, whether it's deforestation, um, whether it's moving, uh, movement of people um, and impact on social, in social ways. And so we came up with this sort of idea. It, it looks, some of these slides everything will look slick now. It did not start off very slick. We started with um, the intention and then we just ran with it and we had um, quite a few interesting bumps in the road. So what we came up with is something called the Sustainable Lush Fund. Um, the main reason we came up with that is because you could shorten it to slush fund, and then when we were experimenting, putting little bits of money here, there, and everywhere with no receipts and things like that, our auditors got really scared. Um, so that was, that was one of the things that I wanted to mess with their heads, basically. Um, since, since its kind of inception and launch, uh, we've donated or invested, depends how you look at it, 2.2 million pounds. Uh, that's in 44 projects in 21 countries. So the, predominantly those are permaculture projects around the world. Um, seven of which now supply lush. And this is where it's a slight difference. We've been looking for material that those projects can then supply us and for them to reach kind of financial maturity through us purchasing the material. So they will no longer need charitable donations or um, sustaining in, in financially, they can sustain themselves. And that's what we've been really looking at. Um, which means that, so in a way, purchasing 240,000 pounds worth of material is more exciting than the donating of the 3.2 million. Um, because that's, that's ongoing and we'll continue to buy that product. Um, so I've got examples of what, what that kind of looks like. <coughs> First we started with um, a peace community in in Colombia, uh, purchasing cocoa, cacao. Uh, th this on its own was quite an achievement because they're, it's a peace community, so they're trying to step out of the cycle of violence. 2,000 people um, who wanted to earn some kind of income and we wanted to support them in some way. But to get hold of the cocoa, we had to make sure they didn't get hijacked on the way out by mm -hmm. paramilitaries um, and guerrillas. Then we had to make sure that we could get the cocoa to Britain without it rotting, which sometimes it did a little bit. Um, the first consignment we, we purchased was £50,000 and it took us nine months to get it from Colombia to Britain um, and it was, it was a bit, uh, well, scary really. If you've got £50,000 out there floating about in the water, you're not quite sure where it is when it's <laughs> going to make it. When it does finally arrive, something we hadn't done before, which is take it from being cacao into butter and powder. Butter we use, powder we don't. And so the team had to really work hard on the logistics of it and trying to learn as we went what that would look like. But that actually made it to the UK and now we use it in a product called the Peace Massage Bath. I'm doing a coming to sell product here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> massage bath. I'll move on. So um, next we we kind of struck on that idea then this is working. We we've got product, we're supporting communities in the way that we'd like. Let's find other sort of individuals or groups that we can work with. And so Paul Yeboah and um, formed the, the Ghana Permaculture Institute. And if any of you are familiar with that, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But he, I mean, he's an absolute legend, this guy. I absolutely love him. He's been out quite a few times to see him. Um, the work he does is incredible. We funded him something like £10,000 initially and then went out to see how he, how he got on in Ghana with it. And I've never seen so much stuff happen with £10,000. I mean, it, he just managed to get things out of nothing. It was quite incredible, including my favourite thing, which is his mushroom project, which literally comes from nothing. It's got waste sawdust that he, every time he walked past the sawmill on the way home, he saw them burning it off his piles of it. Uh, he took the waste sawdust, inoculated it with oyster mushrooms, and set up his own business for free, um, selling mushrooms, which is completely sustainable and actually regenerative business. Um, uh, and that's why we really like Paul. He's an, an incredible entrepreneur. He really saw the value of the money, and how to turn that into something that complemented all the permaculture ethics, fit into that, but also earned him a living. It means he didn't have to rely solely on funding from elsewhere, which is always really difficult, stressful. He set up businesses growing Moringa, uh, selling that internationally. Uh, we helped fund him 
Um, so he bought some brushes so he could brush oil, dry it, and, and sell the leaf and all that sort of stuff. Um, the thing I like most with, it, with Paul is he just does stuff. And sometimes it's a bit of a problem. He, he just goes for it. You know, you give him something, and you don't have to see him again for a year, and, and it'll have blossomed into something incredible. One thing that we funded in particular was 20 acres of land, which was completely degraded, and used for road building. He wanted to, he had this vision for it to be the Ghana Permaculture Institute, and it's on the main road that all the farmers go backwards and forwards to work. It's completely denuded, um, and over the last two or three years, he's really regenerated that land. He's put his mushroom growing on there, Moringa Enterprises, and we funded a, dis a distiller to be there so he can create essential oils. He makes soap, just all these different businesses right there on the doorstep. And all the farmers on their way to work said to him, what on earth are you doing? You're not going to farm there. Maybe gold mining or something? You, you know, the ground's like concrete. And now you, they can see he's doing well because I'll visit him all the time. And it's just really exciting. Um, next we went on to the, on to the Amazon um, and our work there with, with Limba Cabrera. Uh, he had the Recover uh, permaculture site and a colleague of ours, Paolo, knew him well and said, oh, uh, you know, it'd be nice if we could work with him. So he gave me a little bit of money. And at the same time, as a perfumer, I was looking down our list of materials and seeing that rosewood is a real problem. Rosewood has become heavily deforested and actually endangered now. Um, but the essential oil is really lovely for perfume. So what are we going to do about that? You know, that, that's something that we've got a few choices. We can move to a synthetic, maybe some algae can grow it for you in some miracle way. <laughs> or do we actually want to take responsibility for the fact that these, this material, you know, it could be providing jobs in the Amazon if it was created and, and treated it the right way? So we asked Limba, is there any rosewood in your area? Is there rosewood around? You know, I don't know what the Amazon is like. I've, I've not been there at that point. I imagine it's a bit like Dorset where I live. You know, it's not <laughs> easy to get about. So he came back a few weeks later and said, yeah, yeah, found some, found some rosewood. We've got, there's actually a concession up the road. And if we move quickly, I can purchase the logging rights to this concession and, um, and we can maybe start to, to distill rosewood oil if that makes any sense to enough. So we gave him the money um, and he disappeared again. It was £40,000. <laughs> <laughs> and then you spend a little bit of time just wondering, on earth have I gone? <laughs> back for? And then he came back and said, yeah, it's 6,000 hectares, this, this concession. Wow. Yes. <laughs> 6,000 hectares? Okay, oh, that's great. So we got really excited and then the team managed to get um, get out there, and then you realise that it's 20 hours up the river, and um, that, that you've got river pirates, and you've got the possibility of being submerged on the way. And I always found it, I find it very Indiana Jones. It's great. <laughs> I always do it every day. I mean, Luke, back there, you've worked with him. I don't know how you guys do it, popping up and back on the river, and yeah. So it's quite an incredible adventure. And yes, they were able to set up a. They took a, a portable sawmill with them. They kicked the loggers off the land. Um, Limba said it was like Avatar before they got there. There were machines and there were big tracks that were going off into the forest and illegal logging and all sorts of stuff. So moved those guys out, um, not without incident, and then we're able to start distilling rosewood oil. And that's great, you know. There's, again, we can keep the rainforest standing and we've worked out that through pollarding the trees, you don't, you don't need to cut the whole tree, you just pollard the tree. It, it, as much as you need to do to take that little way, distill it, return it to the forest if you want, or use that to fuel your still. And it's actually a really kind of incredible thing. You always hear about deforestation, and when you realise actually you don't need to do that, you keep it standing, and that helps, that, that makes money. Um, <coughs> next we have. I'll never quite get his name right, um, in Kenya. And again, Peter has been working out in the field for years and years as an extension officer for organic farming and trying to support communities. And we, we found him and we were like, okay, how would you like to work together? And he said, well, I've got a type of geranium here that I can grow alongside other crops, um, basically intercropping with, with the local produce. And this is an area where, in actual fact, I heard... Um, George from Porridge talking about you know, food waste and stuff. This is a very fertile area. Huge amounts of uh, food are grown for Tesco's and Asda's and, and all the big supermarkets. And you see it piled up at the side of the road where no one's bought it and they're blocking. So it's not 
for food security there was such an issue, it was more uh, an issue was getting getting a consistent stream of income. And so we struck on, on geranium. Uh, they use it with intercropping, as I said, and it actually benefits the, the uh, product that they're also growing, different from potatoes and things. Oh, go on. And um, through doing that, they can get a sustainable income. It's quite straightforward because you can just put the cut. I say it's straightforward, it's not straightforward, but from <laughs> my perspective, it's really easy. Um, you, you take the cuttings, plant them out, and, and they'll be there for a number of years. So we're not quite sure how long, but you will get at least five or six years worth of growth out of that. So it's a, a nice perennial that you can just stack into any of your systems there, and they and and keep doing a really great job. And we're buying that that essential oil and using it in our products. Um, yeah, I'm not sure my time is up. <laughs> okay, and then kind of finally on the examples, uh, Lakitia and PRI Kenya, who we've also been working with, um, and buying fresh aloe leaves direct from them in the Lakitia region, uh, which is a Maasai region, so dry lands. Um, sort of semi-arid to arid area, very difficult for them to earn any income. Pastoral land, where the pastoral is really driving further kind of uh, desertification. And so we're looking for aloe in particular. It's a it's a an endemic species that's kind of local to that region. It's, it's endangered, but we've been working with the Kenyan Wildlife Services and and the, the correct people so that we can take a sustainable quantity and use that in our products and then provide some valuable income for the women there. Um, it doesn't provide them per income, but it does give them some supplementary income, where these are women who maybe eat once or twice a week um, and, and are left at home whilst the men are out um, uh, with the cattle or with the goats. So we're really looking for those sort of opportunities, opportunities where we can contribute and then prove that people can earn money through doing some of these regenerative practices um, and applying the permaculture principles. And it was something that when we started, we felt, especially in the permaculture world, that it was just ready for that, that a bit of entrepreneurial sort of spirit coupled with all the ethics um, would do something really interesting. And that kind of edge between a, a well-meaning smelly soap company and the permaculture movement could be something quite exciting. And so that's really what we've kind of been working on. Wow. Um, some of the successes we've had, we've demonstrated that it does work. Um, we've demonstrated that people can make money from it. Um, we've also uh, really taken the permaculture principles and tried to connect everybody. You might see a web that went up earlier, really resonates with us, like making sure that our project partners know of each other, and making sure that we can connect skills and strengths and weaknesses and, and complement them. Um, plenty of learning, not just for project, but for us. Um, it's really taught us a lot to look at our business and, and to work on how we act and interact um, with our company. Uh, it's given us products that we can sell, which might seem quite a small thing, but actually means quite a lot, and it gives you a real tangible connection mm. to the to the material. And it's the thing that I love the most when you see that that cycle is closing. You know, you can see mm. you give the money out, and then people have worked hard, and the product comes back, and you've got a real kind of equal uh, feel to it. <coughs> and yeah, and then the people is is by no means the, the the hardest thing to do. Find the right people to work with. And these, in my eyes, these are real heroes. People who have taken the money and they they've worked it really hard. You know, they, they see the value in it, they can see where we're trying to, what we're trying to achieve, and they've worked it really hard. Um, equally, there's been challenges, regulatory challenges, both that the aloe and the roses are listed on CITES, which is an endangered species list. And CITES um, are very thorough, making sure that you can't export that material unless you've got all the proper paperwork, and it is a complete bollocks, sorry. But it's really difficult to, to, to achieve it and to, to make sure we can get product out of the, out of the countries. Mostly because it's annoying to see other people illegally doing it, and not pursuing it. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of irritating. Um, yeah, pirate snakes, and finally um, mosquitoes. And I couldn't really finish without um, <laughs> saying about <laughs> the start small and the and and all that. You know, we we started small, and we feel like we we've got some really interesting next steps. I won't have time to go into this journey right now. Um, but I do need to say that it was Paolo Mello who really started this for us all. Um, and he, for us, he was the guy who really brought that permaculture edge into the business and made it work and made it dynamic. Um, and the fact that he's no longer with us and that um, if you, if you, those of you who don't know, he contracted malaria and died last year. Um, he was the guy that was our guiding light and we, we missed him terribly. Um, but the reason I'm here and why we're all here is that we're still committed to kind of seeing that vision through. And um, 
Yeah, and there's a group of people that you're going to need to make that work. So I'm going to question because um, luckily for me the area I work in is buying and so it's quite easy to then look at what a market value is and to kind of then look at that current practice and think okay is that a, is that a realistic price um, sometimes you find that actually by taking out middlemen and by stripping down the process a bit and working directly with communities that's where your saving is and you can actually achieve some kind of market results that are, are positive other times it's been a real struggle so sometimes you can see we've got the financial success and you think, yeah, we're good about, I feel good about that. Other times you may have over-egged it. Sometimes you pay too much for the foliage somewhere or you pay too much for this and it doesn't quite stack up. And that's where we're in that stage at the minute, just fine-tuning that a bit, working with our partners on, on really making them resilient. So they understand costings and how to analyze that and their cost of goods and supply price and profit in some of those areas. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's a big question. You don't always get it right. We have a good day. Uh, so one of the other things we're quite fortunate in is that we're a privately owned company. Um, and the shareholders are the founders of the business, are the creators of the product, and are, are the, the board. So it's that creates its own hassles. I say this because I, I've worked with my parents, and these people, they changed my nappies when I was a little older. <laughs> we have previous businesses, they've been together for 35 years, but as you can imagine, there's a lot of social capital that's built up between them, so it's a bit complex, but we're quite fortunate in that, that we can proceed with those things because the shareholders are actually invested in it uh, emotionally, not just financially. Do you have any intention of changing that structure? Uh, not right now, although we are in a, an interesting financial with regard to scale. Like for example, when you're starting with experiment in the country, the scale is very small. So maybe it doesn't make sense to export it back to, to Britain. Are you looking at local uh, produce and local markets as well? Are you helping them do that? Or what's your role in that? Uh, well, we try to, <coughs> we try to encourage a, a kind of resilience. We don't have any exclusivity over the material. So any other company can come in and buy it which is a bit, you know, there are people who are a bit kind of concerned about that, but that's for the resilience of that project if something happens to Lush. Um, and then also, Paul's a great example where he's really looked for local market, so the mushroom market is local, and then Moringa, which is an international market, and he's balanced that off. And so we do try and encourage uh, the guys to do that. Uh, it's just what we're finding is that there's time constraints and resource in terms of literally having enough people to do all of that. I'm in India and I see there is a huge, you know, market for the product there. So when you work with the farmers there and you connect yeah. with the local market, the, the whole export and airlifting and couriering and all of that. So yeah, yeah you, you, I think it's nice to have a balance. Certainly from our perspective, I mean, it's the choice of the project and things if they want to continue to deal with this, but from our perspective as an international business, we're hoping we can find a model that does balance off both um, and doesn't just cut. There was a sorry, there was a question at the back, sorry. Can I ask a question for you that's all to the side of the story too? The outcome was that you're able to really create it. Yeah. And there was a question for Anne Cook in the future. How does it pinpoint the solution or the carbon footprint to actually get these raw materials to where they go that need to get to Europe in order to do this? How do you balance that? That's why I think that's the next step for Lush in terms of really we focus purely on the supply in terms of the projects on the ground and working with those guys as an experiment to see can that kind of connection work. Now we're confident that we can get it to work, we're still fine tuning on pricing and things like that. Then it's kind of, okay, what does the rest of the business look like? Because we can't just do that small bit there and not address the kind of the Goliath problem that you have of moving that material, 
selling it, the manufacturer of it once it reaches you. So it, it become and it can become very complex very quickly. So it's kind of we've just started <coughs> focused on the supply, but you're right that then if you're flying stuff in, shipping it in, how should that be done? And and looking at those models, but we haven't got those yet. Um, in kind of following that question. guys have economies of scale and maybe there's like less ecological footprint than lots of tiny people trying to do it on their own. Um, in your industry, is there openness between the different brands that are trying to source ecologically because the value of the ideal is so much kind of greater than the five cents extra each one will make? Or is it more like, no, this is my piece and this is my Moringa and I'm not sharing? Yeah, I think that that's something that's still, we've got kind of, casual alliances with various producers and uh, cosmetic companies that we've had over the years, just through kind of mutual exchange and bumps into people at trade fairs or actually out in the field. And those are the people we tend to want to work with, a bit more people who are also, there's a lot of people saying they're using natural materials and, and doing these sort of products, but then when you get out into the field, you don't see them as much. It's very difficult. I can see the benefit of a partnership or some kind of vehicle that can bring people together and to share the knowledge and and supply and all of that. But I can also see the downside in that it depends on who you have at the table. Um, we've seen it time and time again some of these big multinationals who try and influence for their own gain. Um, you know, we've just started to withdraw from fair trade stuff for exactly that reason where you can see large large companies have come in and it starts to water it down. And I think it comes back to the ethics and stuff is if you share those ethics and you really feel like you've got something and there's a heart connection to it, then I think that would be great. If it's just kind of one of those business as usual, let's see how we can ruin this movement, then I'm not up for it. So yeah. it's kind of a bit. Thank you. One more hand for Lush, Lush, and Simon. books for the Northern Hemisphere, and she co-launched Permaculture Magazine in 1992, becoming its editor in 1996. Um, and Maddie's also been involved since the start of the Gaia Education Program and Sustainability Center. She's been featured in three BBC programs, Her Gardens. And I know I've been sitting there probably like a lot of you all for a long time reading those beautiful magazines, again, inspired by the incredible stories in her views. So please give a hand for Ms. Maddie Harlan. <laughs> Um, and please ignore the um, PowerPoint noise, um, which is quite the problem with temperatures in the north. <laughs> okay, so business. Uh, I actually left university in 1980, and I started my first business, as you said, in 1981, which was actually a whole food shop near Portsmouth that was one of the first ones on the south coast of England. And we used to go to London and buy natural foods for people like Craig Sam um, and then take them back to the South Coast. And one time a guy came in and asked me if I had any military buggies because it was so alien a concept <laughs> that food could be biodegradable packaging um, without additives um, and that maybe you could even scoop it out of a bin and not go near your supermarket at all. And then my life took me out of being a shopkeeper and I became a natural practitioner. Actually, I'm a psychotherapist by training. Um, and I worked a lot in the complementary medicine world because I could see that food was one thing, pharmaceutical business was another. So that's kind of, and then permaculture kind of rocked up like an, a, a, an amazing virus in 1990 my life and that completely out of time. So business. So business is 
usually the dirty thing, and often in permaculture circles, let's be honest, money circles, dirty winter. You know, people do have issues. You know, are you a social enterprise? Are you a commercial business? You know, people still have issues about what Jonathan calls greedy capitalism. So I want to give you three models today, very quickly, and dance across the circle to three different enterprises that are attempting to move away. And another thing that um, Jonathan mentioned that, um, by implication was the idea of the circular economy this morning. So our linear system, um, so luck would come along and it would just buy stuff and create stuff and have no sense of the cycle of reinvestment and, and um, reducing waste and all those kind of principles. But no, they don't. They're totally different. I think they're an incredibly brave company and one that we should be really proud of that is part of this community because we're really good at it. So this is the you know the linear economy, like linear thinking. You know, we harvest natural resources, we manufacture them, and we dump it all. And what we're trying to do is create new circular economies that obviously mimic ecosystems. So produce no waste, or re reinvest in surpluses, using um, fertility cycles to create circular economic models. That's the um, idea. Oh, there's the thing. So I just wanted to start with carbon farming because I think that uh, there's so much to spare. The four horsemen on of the apocalypse sculpturally are uh, actually on the Thames Embankment outside Westminster. And when the tide comes up, we die. It's a sculpture exhibition. When the tide comes up, we die sitting on horses in seats uh, are drowning. And it's a huge allegory of where we are. And for me, carbon farming is actually one of the great beacons of hope in the world and all the development that's going on. So I don't want to give you a lecture on holistic trans raising right now. But this was a monoculture, and this is like, okay, this is day one. This is six months later. So this had virtually no topsoil. It was a, um, a meat farm. It was growing cereals and legumes to feed cattle and sheep. And my friend took over the farm, it was totally plowed out, no hedgerow, and they developed a site called Cool City. And they started to do biological surveys. And they knew when the skylarks were nesting, when the orchids were blooming in the pasture. They threw away all the chemicals that they found in, in the barns, and they started this animal-based, like cyclical pattern, um, succession. They planted thousands and thousands of trees in the first year, backbreaking work on the contour. Um, they started feeding their genetically um, synthesized sheep. So instead of growing in Bethany and Sarl, um, the usual sort of thing that you'd find in the desert or Cornwall, you know, big fluffy thing that when the wind blows and it gets really wet, they fall over and they can't stand up again. Because they're bred for cuts of meat. They've got these guys, which are all sort of northern species, Shetland and Orkney and Outer Hebrides, cattle grazers, um, incredibly <laughs> brilliant grazers who naturally know to go and find food products, forage, the old system. Um, they experimented with goats. They're now experimenting with pasture-fed pigs. Um, they're experimenting with creating products. So this is an example. They don't tend to kill too many of their sheep. They're, at the moment, they're using them as system ecosystem regenerators. They have obviously some of the boys go in the pots and then they're in boxes. They produce what they call vegetarian fleeces, where they, instead of most fleeces in the UK have no economic value, no produce gets done. They're, they're finding markets for these things and they're creating huge information wars. So they're sharing a lot of what they do. So this is a business. It's 
Um, it involves scientific monitoring. It's all about biodiversity um, and yields. It's using, I shouldn't use the word multi-agent because it's planned holistically so that the animals are moved around the farm depending on what um, flower or bird species or, or, or insect pollinator needs to um, thrive at that time and not be disturbed. They're experimenting with different animals so that they can manage systems. Uh, they're looking at medicinals for their animals so that they can self-treat, like the opposite model to any industrial process. Um, they're creating habitat, they're producing fuel. With so this is a, a huge permaculture design that will only gather, but even in the first six months, they started to create soil. And, it, and I'm not going to give you the carbon data on that soil because Albert will when he speaks. But we're talking about enormous potential to not only put people back on the land and create income for them, which is really important, but also to start capturing carbon. And this whole farm just runs with a microtech tractor. You know, John Deere, eat your heart out, is going bankrupt. <laughs> <laughs> and there are other sporting years as well. So they're experimenting with reintroducing <coughs> native black beans virtually lost in the UK. So that's just one, so I would say to you that this is farming as metabolism. There's no waste, there's only cycles. And within that cycle are a serious polycultural um, focus on you know, many, many years and much tracking of cycling. And these are the key words for me. So I'm now gonna move on to a typical model of education. Because we do education well at home, yeah? Okay, so Sustainability Centre, it used to be um, HMS Mercury, it was a military base. Uh, Naval Communications removed out of um, Portsmouth, which had been bombed in the Second World War, they stuck it up on a hill, and they trained every single person in the Navy um, on communication skills. They also had a secret base officer, it's called SDU, Special Defence Unit, there's lots of underground tunnels, and that was where all the translators and the, the listeners from GCHQ in the UK were there, basically were doing a huge trading of the um, <coughs> metal that the Romans and the Vandals did. We got hold of it in 1995, it came out of the Rio conference, the local government wanted to do something educational, so they did a planning deal. The developers got 100 acres. We got 55 acres. We got the, the acreage full of asbestos and overstood woodlands. You know, we got the, the bit that was too expensive to do commercial drilling for. And it was a mess. And over the last, well, it took us at least five years to set up the charity and actually get onto the land. We had no proper funding. Um, and we were in a culture where we lost our um, Liberal Democrat local government and inherited a Conservative one who was Barry Thatcherer. So we soon, soon became extremely unpopular. Um, and this could be another aspect. If I was doing a workshop, I'd have a long old chat about politics and staying under the wire, which is very important that we do. Because I could get published and yurts that people can hire. We have a, a, a quite an inexpensive um, renovation of an ugly naval uh, accommodation block that's now a local hostel. We get about 3,000 kids a year on site doing education. We teach PVC because it had starhawk and rosemary moray and all sorts of very funky people to hamster. Um, doing social permaculture last week. Um, we have our own natural burial site. Um, and all of these nested stacked enterprises 
are all sort of there in this whole lovely system that's flowing and affecting each other. And ultimately, it feeds in money. Come across to a magazine in my book publishing company is there. We all, we pay rent, I pay in. And so the charity takes a self-financing. It generates its own revenue. It is not politically vulnerable to changes in policy and funding. It doesn't require any core funding to actually run and pay the wages. It only uses grants and um, donations for capital projects like repairing and um, expanding solid old <coughs> buildings. So we're not beautiful. Some of some parts of us are pretty nice now, but we've still got some eyesores. Um, we have about 15 staff, but we do a lot of job sharing because we find that enables people to have another life and not be completely swallowed up by their working life. Um, we host sustainable businesses and another social enterprise on site that's all about looking after young people who have um, serious special needs that have got side to down syndrome and it's like they come in to throw food and do food crafts and so very much part of our community. So if and we run an active burial site and that is one of our most important activities on site. So we bury people, we have total open policy, you can do it however they like, um, in terms of religious or not religious religion. And so all of this creates financial stability. And we've designed all our financial systems to be based on a commercial enterprise. So our accounting systems are really transparent. Each department knows exactly where it is. We, we know where our costs are coming from. We know where our income's coming from. We have projections, we have budgets, and we've spent a lot of time on financial management and structure. It's critically important. I think it makes drawing from old designs die. <laughs> and I love the principle. So if you're not into it, as you guys explained in your first lesson, find a man who loves counting or a woman <laughs> and loves it. Take him to your lunch with a t-shirt. <laughs> He's called Peter Ellington and he is an accountant and saint. <laughs> so we do all these things and we also run a volunteering program and we don't charge people to come and volunteer. And the whole thing is about beneficial relationships, partnerships. If you want any of these images, because this is in the latest 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 first lesson, I think. Um, but if you want any, they're there, um, out there in the world, and I can email them to you. Okay, so Usherite. A lot of people don't perhaps realise that we've published over 50 books now, and we're not any more just a print publisher. We have e-books, we have um, websites, we have YouTube, Jonathan mentioned our Living with the Land series. Um, and the core for us is the ethics. If you walk away and you think permaculture is about fly, applying ecosystem thinking without including the ethics, have I actually come as close as you're sure of it? What is it, permaculture voices in the States earlier this year? And I, I kind of felt that um, slight wish to step beyond a farm to a fair and fair sale and limit the growth and actually think, you know, have this thinking about, okay, how can we have an abundant system? But without ethics, it's nothing. And it's really easy to apply the ethics in some ways. And it's really difficult. I've never published, printed any book in China. It probably cost me 150, 200 thousand pounds not doing that over the last 25 years, maybe 40 of a million. I've never been able to found a true apocalyptic to my cash flow. But that's partly who we are. We were brought locally. We live by our principles. And we're not going to do it. We talked a lot about cooperation, and that's the absolute key. I'm the mouthpiece of our business, but I'm only in one member of what whole team. And the whole thing is utterly collaborative. No one is more important. And we have gender balance on our team. 
the stats is really important. And we also have diversity of ages and experience. And no one just seems to know or makes the tea or does the packing. We all share the work. And actually, I'm really good at tea, you know, I'm almost bad at them. I see it more with some people. So, you know, it's like, it's not a hierarchical structure. It's a system structure. It's a community. And it's a community based on respect. And it's taken me 25 years to honestly say to you, I have built a team with my, you know, the guys that have been there longer. And that team, there is no one to Every one of them are really valuable, really experienced people, and we're all different. So there's no feasting going here. There's no stellar personalities swapping people around. And the key for me to sustainable business is multifunctional stack enterprises. So when you start to do something as a team, as a, as a business, you have to have three reasons or three outputs every project or every aspect or action that you create. It's, it's no good having that kind of old linear monocultural thinking. So we produce a book, we produce um, information, we produce downloads, we might produce a YouTube, we might produce website articles, and you know, as a media product, project, we're always trying to maximise the edge of our functionality. How many years can we create in this polyculture? And this is just a diagram that I don't have time to go into, but it's, it's all about those sub-stacks, enterprises that are about the system thinking of it and, and trying to maximise the edge and the yield. So what are we doing? We're using principles, of course, and some really beneficial relationships have to do with sustainability. You cannot you know, if you want to reduce carbon, you have to have contract out some of your logistics. So we're ship we ship books. So it's madness if you're trying to, you know, you need to find ways of working with other people. So we work with those carbon people in Australia. We work with Chelsea Green in the States. With Sprint in the States, it's, it's more book. It's a, you know, logical producer. We're trying not to ship materials. We're trying to spread viral information. We're trying to observe patterns and then work from them into detail. And of course, things like relative location. Um, this is all about working with local centres and trying to support other businesses. And of course, we use, you know, we're taking renewable. Even our server is actually um, a renewable energy server um, from Germany. And it's actually cheaper than the fossil fuel one that we used to buy the service from a few years ago. So I'm going to finish now. But I just want to say to you that I don't think that even commercial enterprise is just about selling stuff and producing products. I think we have to all look at the disposal. We have to develop stuff that we can give away. We have to tie it out like Lush are. You know, we are, we don't have, we're not cash intensive, our business, we can spend bits faster than we earn it, but we are information intensive, so we can give away all sorts of stuff, and we do, we, we do, you know, there are three aspects of the magazine, one you're here, um, we put away our exercise back issue, we give away thousands of uh, permaculture ebook downloads per year, and, and we actually find that by doing that, the network builds. And it actually, you know, you give and you take and it comes back to you. So I'm going to finish and just say, stay in touch and don't forget that um, your products are what we want to care about. We want to tell the world about you. Give away a hand. Thank you very much for asking that. I'd just like to pay my tribute to 